Here we go. Okay, so welcome to the biology capstone here at St. Thomas University. And this biology capstone course is um, technically the last course in your bachelor's program, all right? Because um, you have been working at your bachelor's either here at St. Thomas for the duration of your bachelor, typically four years, or you have transferred in from another uh, university and are completing your degree here with us. So uh, first, uh, the big picture about the biology capstone, it has like a dual purpose. It has a purpose for you students and it has a purpose for us faculty also. Uh, for the students, essentially it is a review of the entire curriculum of biology that you have had so far, okay? And it is compressed into one semester. For us, for faculty, it is the assessment of our program. So basically, in the measure that uh, you do well in this course and you look good, it makes us look good because it means that uh, we taught something and you learned something of what we taught, all right? So what we do is we use a standardized test. Uh, have any of you taken a standardized test? Uh, Maybe probably the last standardized test you took was the SAT or something like that in high school. I don't know if in during your college time you have taken another standardized test. Anyone taken a standardized test uh, during college? No? Okay, how about uh, you remember your SAT or the, the equivalent uh, of the SAT? Okay, anyway, a standardized test means that uh, this test typically they're online and you're competing against a whole population of students who is taking the same test uh, nationwide, all right? So uh, typically standardized tests are either exit test or, or entrance test. For example, uh, you've heard of the GRE, right? Graduate Record Examination. Okay, so the GRE is used to typically to get into graduate school, okay? Uh, there are two components to the GRE. There's a general GRE of uh, subject matter, and then there is a field, in-field GRE, for example, in biology or chemistry or whatever other discipline one is going into at the graduate level. So that uh, test at GRE is an entrance test. It's entrance for graduate school. This one, the test that you'll be taking, which is called the um, biology field test, uh, is going to be an exit test, meaning that you'll be tested at the end of your bachelor's to see how much you've actually learned and retained. And like I say, this, um, this test is being given nationwide all the time, all right? So there's a data bank that is accumulating with all the students who are taking this uh, major field test, uh, biology, in biology. It, it occurs in uh, very different, uh, various different uh, disciplines. So what happens is uh, you score a percentile, right? And of course, the higher the percentile, then, um, that means that the student is toward the top of the number of students who took that test nationwide in uh, during this time. In the time could be several months and so, but basically it's the same test that every other student is taking. So that's why uh, you're competing there nationwide. And what it's doing is, it's actually testing our, um, it's assessing our program against the biology programs, the, bio, the bachelors in biology of many other universities throughout the United States. See how it works? So it's a very good test. A standardized test means that they have been uh, mm, um, so let's see how, how to put this. Uh, um, they're fairly objective. The measurement is objective because you have on any given 
population of students that is taking the test, they're coming from many different universities, many different uh, programs. But the one characteristic that is in common is that all the students who are taking this test are uh, finishing a bachelor's in biology. It could be a private university, it could be a public university, you know, and it's throughout the whole United States. So it's a very strong, we call it robust. It's a robust measure of how our program is doing with the other biology uh, bachelor programs uh, throughout the United States. And for you also, because it lets you know how you are individually, personally, um, at a national standard, at a national standard. And that's precisely why it's called standardized, all right? So let's say uh, the bar, we set the bar at 70 percentile, all right? And so 70 percentile or above is passing. And this course is a pass, no pass uh, course. If you get uh, less than 70 percentile, you have to take the test again. And there are three times for taking the test. Uh, the first time will be next Friday. <laughs> Cold turkey, just like that, uh, right off the bat, if you will, without uh, much immediate preparation, except if you saw my email uh, a couple of months ago or about a month ago, more or less, uh, before uh, Christmas time, to alert you to this and to encourage you through uh, the Christmas break to do some reading in biology, especially the areas that you're weak in, right? Because you're not gonna study the areas that you know. If you know it, you don't need to study it, but rather the areas where you're weakest. And typically in our program in general, the weakest area is in population biology and ecology because we don't cover that as strongly as we cover uh, organismal biology, which is uh, the organ systems uh, and then also uh, cellular, molecular, and biochemistry. So into the cell, we're stronger. And then at the population level, we are weaker. We know that from our program and um, we're taking steps to uh, remedy that uh, going forward, all right? Um, but uh, so back to the three times of taking the test. Uh, the first time will be, like I said, next uh, Friday, uh, starting at 4 p.m. here on campus. And then uh, if you get a 70 percentile or above, you're done. You're done with the course. You pass. Goodbye. See you at uh, graduation. OK. If you don't pass the first time, then uh, there's a second chance, which will be at midterm in about eight weeks. Uh, that's the second chance. And then if you still don't pass the second chance, you have a third chance, which will be uh, toward finals, all right, finals week, maybe we'll do it like the week before final, uh, final exams, uh, so that uh, this is out of the way by the time you do your actual final uh, exams for each uh, particular course that you're taking right now. All right, so you have those three chances. And I can tell you, a number of students passed the first time. Mm -hmm. Uh, not everyone typically, but uh, a good number uh, pass. It depends on the population. Each uh, student population is uh, somewhat different each semester, all right? But a number of uh, you pass uh, the first time around. Uh, if you don't, then uh, most of you actually pass at uh, midterm. Hmm? And uh, some have actually uh, passed at midterm. Um, and there's no one for the final, the third time. But it, again, it depends on the cohort. Uh, uh, if you don't pass the second time, then typically you do pass on the third time, all right? But it means that you have to stick with the course for all this time. Okay, there's Brian. Morning, Brian. Welcome. I'm recording the session, so you'll catch up uh, when, um, when I send you the video of this uh, recording, okay? All right, so in the meantime, what happens is uh, if you don't pass, the first time around, all right, like next Friday. Then you go into a weekly review of uh, Campbell, essentially, of Campbell's biology. And this weekly review, so Campbell has about 55 chapters, more or less, and depending on the edition. And it's five chapters per week, five chapters per week. So it is very fast paced, all right? And the way we assess it is there is a test that it's a multiple choice test that you do in Canvas for this course. 
um, on Friday. Well, it's due Friday at midnight. Every Friday at midnight, this um, this uh, multiple choice test is uh, due. It's uh, 70 questions for 60 minutes, so it's time. And that's uh, what the standardized test is also, is um, 70 questions for 60 minutes uh, twice, right? Uh, twice, so it's uh, one hour, then there's a small break, and then there's another hour, uh, so it's double. And the reason for the 70 questions in uh, 60 minutes is that when you do the math, you have a little less than a minute per question on average. So you have about 55 seconds more or less per question on average. I'll get more into the details uh, later, but let me stay uh, again with the overall uh, view of the course first. So again, you if you don't pass this first time around, then you engage in these um, weekly uh, a test, a multiple choice test, right? That are done, like I say, online uh, through Canvas. It's due by Friday midnight. And then in a couple of minutes after that, you get the results. So by Saturday at 12.01 AM, the results are posted. So just uh, if you stay there for a minute or two, you will see your score for that particular um, multiple choice uh, test, all right, the, the weekly one. And like I say, it's five chapters uh, per week of Campbell. So <clears throat> it will start like the week after um, the week after the standardized test. And uh, so that week is uh, Campbell one through five, chapters one through five. And then the following week, it's uh, six through 10. And then the following week is 11 through 15 chapters, et cetera, et cetera. And it continues to go through all of the, um, the book of uh, Campbell. Those uh, weekly tests um, are essential that you do for two reasons. First, it's required, but also it gives you points. It gives you extra points. So for example, again, assuming uh, one doesn't pass on the first time around, you start engaging in these weekly uh, tests um, and by the time you get to the midterm, if you have done them all and uh, you have done good scores, okay, then let's say you don't get a 70 percentile at the midterm, but you get maybe a 68 or a 67 or something like that in the high 60s. And you have done your weekly quizzes, depending on how well you have done on those weekly quizzes, then I will pass you. I will pass you because you have accumulated extra points with those weekly quizzes, all right? So it has a, an added advantage. Of course, the primary advantage of the weekly uh, quiz or the weekly test is to review that those five chapters of Campbell systematically, right? That's the, that's the idea. And, uh, and the added advantage is that you get points for it, all right? Mm. Let's see, what else? Oh yes, okay, so this course is really flipped. This is, uh, you, may have heard, you may have heard before at some point uh, flipping the classroom, flipping the classroom, right? And this is in my mind, the truly flipped course. Uh, flipped meaning that you're gonna teach yourself. You're gonna teach yourself. So you'll be reviewing five chapters of Campbell every week. And then, like I say, Friday before midnight, you have to allow yourself some time, you know, don't wait until Friday 11 a.m., 11 p.m. Uh, because you're gonna run out of time. But uh, sometime Friday evening, or you can take it even before because the, the course, that uh, test is actually open for the whole week. You can take it earlier if you feel confident about the five chapters in particular, and you've done the review by Wednesday or Thursday, you can take it then, all right? But you can only take it once and it's timed and then it closes once you take it. So you really do have to be prepared for it. At any rate, you're going to teach yourself, all right? In other words, you're going to be reviewing Campbell, um, like I say, chapter by chapter, week by week and so forth. And uh, you're gonna find that most of the material in Campbell, hopefully, if you've paid attention in the past four years, right? Uh, you will know most of the material, but you will find areas where uh, you don't know, you don't remember, or you were confused, or you didn't learn it uh, correctly the first time around, etc. 
So you're going to fill in the blanks yourself by teaching yourself, right? Okay, so uh, that's the true flip of the classroom where the student actually teaches herself or himself. And then we professors remain as um, assessors, uh, we remain um, available for you for consultation, all right? Uh, the five of us. In other words, uh, Dr. Moll, Dr. Tapanes, uh, Dr. Pina, um, Dr. Plunkett, myself. Uh, we remain available for you anytime uh, in case you run into a question that you cannot, um, a topic that you cannot understand. So, uh, let me stop here for a moment before I get into the detail of the subject matter itself, and let's see if there are any questions or comments. Uh, are people understanding what I'm saying so far? Yes. Yes. Okay. I have one question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Kevin? Please. No, it's Ricardo. Oh, sorry. Um, you said that there was two sections, um, so is it... Um, is it 35 questions or is it 140 questions? Like, what did you mean by there's two sections on the exam? Right, it's 140. In other words, it is two sessions, sessions of 70 minutes, seven, of uh, 60 minutes each, all right? It's two sessions. So uh, think of it this way. The test is actually two hours long and um, <clears throat> It's 140 questions total. Of course, they're not the same question, all right? It's 140 different questions. And they're also mixed. They don't follow a progression necessarily. In other words, uh, for the purpose of study and teaching, you notice that there's a progression where typically we start with uh, cellular biology and molecular biology. In fact, we even start with atomic theory and so forth and the macromolecules and all that. And when we continue to build up, look at uh, cellular, uh, the cell, and then we scale up to tissues and organs. And then now we're in, we're in organismic biology, organ systems, and then the individual plant, animal, fungi, etc. And eventually we get into population biology and ecology. So you see that for the purpose of study, there is a systematic progression there, basically from the smallest to the largest, right? But at this test, of course, uh, it doesn't follow that progression necessarily. They were scrambled around. So question number one could be something about population biology. And question number 140 could be something about molecular biology. You follow? OK, but it's 140 questions, two hours. It's just that after the first 60 minutes, the student can take a break if you want to. If you don't want to take the break, you can continue through. It's prudent to take the break, especially to go to the restroom or something like that, right? Uh, because once that clock starts for the 60 minutes, whereas the first 60 or the second 60, it doesn't stop. It's a countdown. And on the, on the upper right of the screen, you see the countdown. It will start at 60, 59, 58, et cetera, and it will be counting down, all right? So did I address the question, Ricky? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Uh, what else? Any other questions or comments? Okay, you people are absorbing everything, either that or you're far away having breakfast or something. <laughs> good. So let's see. Um, I'll talk, uh, I'll talk uh, later about the strategy, the test strategy itself. Remind me to talk a little bit about that, but I don't want to get into that uh, yet. It's uh, kind of detailed. I still want to stay with the big picture. Um, let's see, I was on uh, teaching yourself, flipping the classroom. Uh, yes, so this course will confirm for you, if you don't know this already, that basically, you can teach yourself anything you want, 
all right? And so it uh, really, it, it builds character that way. It builds tremendous confidence because at this point, you know, you started your bachelor typically 18, 17, 18, 19 years old, uh, young, still a teen, a teenager, and now you're a young adult uh, four years later. And a lot of growth and development has happened there, even in your brain, organically speaking. Uh, this is a little aside, but I like to talk about uh, the brain. You know, we have the mind and the brain. The mind is basically the psychological uh, thought process that goes on, but the brain is the organic uh, material, uh, the substratum, if you will, the, the, the biochemical organic material where thinking occurs. All right, which in itself is interesting, the, the interaction between the mind and the brain, um, because one is abstract uh, and the other one is uh, concrete material. Uh, but anyway, it is um, known that the human brain, which is really the most complex organ there is uh, uh, on earth uh, for any species, right? It takes is is the organ that takes the longest to mature, to mature physiologically. All right, and it takes an average of uh, between twenty to twenty five years for uh, the brain to fully develop. And actually, what happens is is something interesting because it, it's not an asymptotic curve that continues to grow and grow until it plateaus. No. It's actually more uh, kind of um, mm, uh, like a sigmoid uh, curve, uh, like a bell shape a little bit because we have more neurons, uh, neuronal connections um, during the teen years, the early teen years, all right? And, but it's almost too many neuronal connections. In other words, let's say for the first dozen years, the brain is growing tremendously in size and in synapses. You know what the synapses are by now. If you don't, then uh, you really need to look it up quickly. <laughs> All right, uh, so the, the brain is growing tremendously, even in embryonic development, but we're born with a very immature brain. All right, because nine months of development is not enough for the brain uh, to grow, and uh, that's uh, again, that's a that's a uh, physical issue, right? If the brain were to grow more uh, during the embryonic stage, in other words, that pregnancy would be longer than nine months, let's say eleven or twelve months, one year. Some animals, some mammals, uh, have a year or more of uh, of uh, pregnancy, right? The brain would be too large to pass through the birth canal. And the woman giving birth would need a huge um, uh, pelvis, right, to be able to pass that head through. And so it's not economical, all right? And so in, in the evolution of the human species over time, it, it has to do in part the fact that we're bipedal, that we walk on, on our hind legs, all right? And that has given us a tremendous synergistic advantage because it has freed up the, the four limbs, uh, the, in other words, four F-O-R-E, the, 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 um, the hands. It has freed up the arms and the hands for uh, tools and tool making, all right? And we're the only mammal that has that, um, that capacity and has developed it tremendously, tremendously. Uh, at any rate, it has to do with the maximum girth or, or of, um, of the pelvis of uh, the female. So that the bottom line is that we're born kind of prematurely, <laughs> all right, uh, compared to other mammals. And so that's why the first year of uh, the child of the baby is uh, so, so important uh, that that child be kept uh, safe and so forth because that brain needs to continue to grow um, uh, further after, after birth. Anyway, it will, the brain will continue to grow. And you notice that the, the skull of a child is not even fused, okay? The different plates are not fused yet because uh, that brain needs to expand and literally the cranium needs to get larger until we hit the teen years more or less, the early teen, let's say a dozen years, uh, pretty much our head is about the size that it's going to be for the rest of our lives, right? 
But then what's happening is that the synapses are connecting tremendously at a very fast rate, all the millions and billions of synapses are connecting, especially on the cortex, which is where thought occurs, abstract thought, which is the higher capacity of the brain. And then what happens is we almost have too much circuitry, too much circuitry. You can think of it this way in a sense, uh, I'm here in my office looking out at the Palmetto Expressway, all the uh, morning uh, rush hour traffic there. If we had too many streets in the city, you know, there wouldn't be space for, uh, of course, the traffic would be faster throughout the city if we had uh, streets all over the place in, through the blocks, uh, but we, there wouldn't be enough space for houses and buildings to be built. All right. So uh, too much of a good thing is a bad thing, <laughs> right? Too many streets or too many highways through the city is a bad thing for that city. It will decongest traffic for a while, but then it will make actual living in the city impossible. So there has to be a trade-off, right? Of uh, what is the optimal number of streets and avenues and uh, roads and highways to have and still have a functional city, an urban uh, area that, that can work. And so that's uh, the brain kind of develops in these two stages. First, there's that uh, growth spurt. Uh, maximizing the number of uh, synapses uh, for the first dozen years, more or less. And then after that comes a process. Once the brain has reached its uh, full capacity, which is on average about 1350, uh, 1350 cubic centimeters, all right? Um, then there is a process called synapse pruning, synapse pruning, which is that the brain itself through biochemical pathways starts disconnecting some synapses and consolidating some other synaptic networks, all right? So some synaptic networks are shut down and disconnected and others are reinforced, okay? So it's when you, you can think of it this way, you have a city and you have put streets and avenues on the map first, just you're designing a city, we're designing a city and we have put the streets and avenues uh, and then we go ahead and, and build that initial city with the roads that are um, two lanes, one way, uh, two, two lanes, two ways. So there's one lane on each way, right? And then we expand gradually some uh, streets and avenues, every 10 or 15 streets, we expand it, we double lane it, right? So now we have a four lane uh, street, two ways going one way, two ways going the other way. And then after a while, as the city continues to grow, then we expand again. I actually saw that happening in Kendall Drive uh, down in the Southwest of Miami. I remember Kendall Drive beyond the Palmetto Expressway was just two lanes, two lanes, one each way, all right? Now it's six lanes three lanes one way, three lanes the other way. Then I saw it happen uh, beyond the turnpike going west on the same uh, on the same Kendall Drive, if you're familiar with the Southwest. Beyond the, the turnpike, which wasn't there yet, uh, it's the area of Miami-Dade um, uh, College. Um, it was a dirt road. Kendall Drive beyond the turnpike back I'm going back 50 years, okay, half a century, was actually a dirt road. And you can go out there and, and pick berries and uh, strawberries and stuff like that. Anyway, that dates me. Yes, uh, uh, that was uh, last century. But, uh, you know, so uh, the synaptic pruning, synaptic pruning is that um, some networks of the brain are uh, shut down and others are reinforced and consolidated. And that actually makes for better thinking. <laughs> it makes for better thinking so that we don't have a confused morass of signaling going through the brain, through the cortex, all right? And that's why teenagers can be confused and adults are not supposed to be confused because we have a more consolidated uh, highway uh, network of, um, of the cortex, of the cerebral cortex. And that synaptic pruning takes another dozen years more or less, okay? So that's what gets us to the 20 to 25 year uh, old more or less on average. That's when we, uh, our brain is on average fully mature, okay? 
Uh, another little aside on that is that, um, you know, what industry got that data right and has used it uh, galore actually to make millions and millions of dollars. Uh, if you have a driver's license, and I don't know who's paying for your insurance, maybe your parents are, maybe you're paying for the insurance. If you're paying for the insurance, then you really can't wait until you become what age? What age does the insurance drop? Isn't it 26? 26, okay, I thought it was 25, but anyway, uh, it's around there, 25, 26, right. Absolutely, you see, so the insurance industry, the car insurance industry has actually used that data to do their numbers because uh, again, they're working on a statistical model, right? The insurance company is insuring hopefully thousands or millions of people. And so they're working on average, a mature brain is less likely to get into an accident on average, okay? So again, adults on average are less likely to have an accident, a car accident than a teenager. <laughs> And that's why the teenage um, uh, car insurance is higher. It's based on that, on the maturation of the brain. And then, but also that is uh, corroborated. That is um, the proof of that is in the pudding. In other words, in the accidents. So it's a very simple statistic to uh, do just a two column uh, data set where you have the, uh, the number of accidents and the age of the person who was driving at that accident, okay? It actually doesn't even matter who was at fault <laughs> uh, because the numbers are so large, right? The population is so large that the number again is statistically robust. And that's what happens. It corroborates, you know, on average uh, around 24 to 26, let's like, say years of age, more or less, the um, rate of uh, accidents uh, drop, right? And so the insurance agency adjust accordingly so that they can stay competitive with each other. That's uh, also part of the market economy, competition and so forth. Anyway, all this long-winded thing to say that uh, you should be coming up to the <laughs> maturity of your brain organically speaking, right? Then there's also the will. The will is very interesting because the will can uh, kind of, um, I don't know if it can actually shortchange it or not, but it could conceivably speed it up if you consciously, if one consciously makes an effort to try to think rationally, logically, systematically, organize in an organized way and so forth, perhaps, perhaps, I'm, I'm not a neurologist by any extent of the imagination, but perhaps that synaptic pruning could be accelerated somewhat and a person may be able to reach that organic maturity a little earlier, not actually have to wait until 25, you know. Conversely, to me, it makes sense that if a person is not using their brain properly and it's like exercise, right? There's physical exercise and there's mental exercise. If a person is not doing mental exercise, basically study, <laughs> um, then maybe that uh, maturation process will be delayed. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, Anyway, uh, in my lifetime, uh, I'm 68 years old and uh, as a priest for over 35 years, I've met a lot, a lot of people in my lifetime and I've run into some people that I call chronological adults. Chronological adults for me are people who are in their 30s, 40s or 60s or 70s, right? Uh, but they still have the mind of a teenager. <laughs> Those are what I call kind of sarcastically chronological adults. Their body is one age, but their mind is a different age, all right? And you don't want to be a chronological adult. <laughs> you want to be a real adult. At any rate, uh, back to uh, the biology capstone, yes. So we have this test coming up, okay? And um, <clears throat> Uh, let's see, any other questions or comments before I go forward a little bit? Uh, we are. So um, in regards, Dr. Trophy. Yeah, Andres. So in, re in yes, I'm sorry. Uh, in regards to the exams, it's yeah. literally the entire, well, in essence, it's the entire textbook of, ca of, the, of the Campbell biology. There's really like no basis of what we should target first or or anything, we should go off of like what we basically don't know as much. Right, 
Yes, right. This is to get it started, okay? But you gave me an idea. It's a dangerous idea, and I'm warning you beforehand. This is the idea. Since uh, you're all going to be taking this test, God willing, uh, next Friday, all right, at 4 p.m., then um, you will know. You will know then what uh, area you're weakest in, because you may think you're weak in one area, but then when you test, you're not, uh, you're actually, excuse me, not weak in that area, <laughs> okay? And uh, you had uh, deceived yourself for some reason that you thought that you were weak and you weren't really that weak in that area. Or it could be that your suspicions are confirmed <laughs> with uh, the testing. Yes, okay, so this uh, gets me into the other area. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about the subject matter itself, which is really what counts at the end of the day. Um, biology uh, traditionally has been divided into three areas, again, for the purpose of study. And they more or less follow that, uh, that uh, sequence from smallest to largest. And the three main areas are what is known as uh, CMB, organismo and population biology. Okay, CMB is an acronym for cellular, molecular, and biochemistry. In other words, from the cell in microscopic, think of it this way, from the cell in microscopically, including all the pathways, uh, the level of cellular respiration, photosynthesis, etc. Then organismal biology has to do with the, the organism, individual organism, and the organ systems. So organs and systems of the body, not only the human body, but uh, animals, plants, uh, fungi, et cetera. So that's organismal biology. And that's uh, macroscopic in the sense that we can see it already. You know, So it's from tissue up, tissues, organs, and organ systems. And then population biology is when you have two or more individuals interacting with each other, they form a population. And then populations of different species interacting form communities communities plus the abiotic factors, which the abiotic factors are uh, the weather, soil conditions, et cetera, then that forms an ecosystem, right? And then the various ecosystems of the world form the biomes and so on and so forth. So that's population biology slash ecology. Those are the three main areas. And what the uh, test does, what this um, ETS, ETS is the Educational Testing Service. I refer to the test as ETS, another acronym, because this is the outfit that designs, uh, this is the, the, uh, the company that designs this uh, biology standardized test, okay? ETS, Educational Testing Services. I'm gonna send you a link uh, where you can look it up. It's from Princeton, New Jersey. They're the same ones who designed the GRE, for example. So very prestigious, they've been uh, in business for uh, many, many years, and that's their expertise, okay? We buy the test from them, it's $25, it's included, uh, each time you take it, it's 25 bucks, right? So if you pass the first time, you say it was uh, $50. <laughs> uh, at any rate, uh, it's, it's paid for by the department, okay? It's part of the, your tuition, you can look at it that way. But basically, they're testing you in these areas, in these three areas, and then, at the end of, the, of that test, right, the standardized test, you will get the result right there on the screen. You get the, the overall the, the, the overall score, which is the one that I am focusing on for the 70 percentile. That's the score that we focus on, the overall. And then it will break it down also by the three sections. And so it can tell you, it will tell you there, which of those three sections uh, you are weakest in, right? And which you're strongest. All right, and then what you wanna do is you wanna focus on that weakest area, because I can tell you folks also, this is no secret, um, the, it's the same test that you keep taking over and over again, all right? So if you don't pass the first time, at midterm is the same test, <laughs> right? And if you don't pass at midterm, uh, for finals is the same test again, it's the same questions. They may scramble the questions, so the question one now is question 55 and the next time around, and they may scramble also within each question the, the five um, uh, multiple choice, the, the five answers, right? But the questions and the answers, they're all there and they're repeated because um, in a few months, they don't have time really to change the test significantly. So they change it periodically, but it's not every month or anything like that, all right? So within the academic year, within the academic semester, pretty much is the same test, right? 
So that's an advantage because by the second time around, you would have seen the questions or at least once already. Mm -hmm. Of course, when you get that score at the end of the test, at the end of the two hours, when you get that score, it doesn't tell you which specific questions you got right and which you got wrong. But typically you have a feel for which ones uh, you were confident and which ones you were not confident, all right? But it doesn't tell you the specific question that you got right or you got wrong because at that point they may be giving away the test itself, right? It just gives you the overall score. Mm -hmm. So back to your question, um, Andres, uh, what I'm thinking of doing is this. Uh, so each week, the test will start, let's say, for the sake of argument, okay, so week one, let's talk about week one, which would be, if you don't pass this coming Friday, then week one would be Monday, uh, in, in two Mondays, right? That would be week one. Uh, actually, the, the test opens on Sunday. So, uh, by the way, Sunday is always the first day of the week, right? All right, so that Sunday, you start reviewing, and the test is already open, the weekly test. It's already open. You could take it Sunday if you want, if you feel very confident about the first five chapters of Campbell, you feel very confident, you know it back, forward, backwards, all right? You can take the test Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, et cetera, anyway, up until Friday. Uh, what I could do is really uh, set the opening date forward. I'm not going to move forward the closing date. I'm going to put the closing. I'm going to keep the closing date where they are. In fact, you can get into campus already and look at it. You can see the closing dates are weekly every Friday consecutively. All right. And so the closing date is there. But if I forward the opening date, okay, nothing prevents you on week one, if you know the first five chapters well, and you have even taken the test for chapter, uh, for the first, uh, let's say test one, you have taken that test one and you did well, and you're still in week one, you can move on to week two and start studying and reviewing chapters six through 10. So if I move forward the opening date for that, uh, for test number two, you could also take that test number two, even in week one, all right? Uh, because you know the material and you're actually moving forward. You're going at your own pace is what you're doing. You're going at your own pace and you're moving forward and doing the quizzes and, and doing well in the quizzes so you can move forward faster. If I, if you, we use that argument for every single week of the 11 weeks or so 55 chapters uh, in, in, uh, we divided five chapters a week, it's 11 weeks, right? If I move forward all of the dates the starting date, you actually have access to all, uh, all uh, 11 quizzes. All 11 quizzes, you have access to all of them. And then what you would do after your first test, standardized test, after next Friday, assuming you didn't pass, you would concentrate on the area that you know the least, which could be, again, on average, it's gonna be in the population biology side, right? Which are the later chapters. You could concentrate on that. The danger is this, and I said there's a danger. The danger is this, that generally, generally, further knowledge implies prior knowledge. So for example, we can't really do algebra without knowing arithmetic, okay? And we cannot do arithmetic without actually knowing the numbers and the number system and the fact that there are 10 numbers from one to 10, et cetera, and that we have a zero uh, and, and there are negative numbers and so forth, okay? So there's a progression generally. But sometimes you can do certain areas without having detail. For example, you could do certain level of population biology without having a deep uh, knowledge about uh, biochemistry or cellular biology, okay? But there's a danger, there's a risk because generally knowledge is cumulative, right? And that's why it's taught that way systematically. But yes, I can move the, the um, opening date forward all the way, all the way. And I'll probably do that this coming week. You still have, uh, um, so my suggestion is at this point, really concentrate on the ETS test that you're gonna take next Friday, okay? So basically you have this, this week to focus on the area in Campbell 
that uh, you are weakest. Again, just go to the uh, table of contents and in all honesty, that's why flipping the classroom works for the honest student because you really want to be self-critical. You wanna say, okay, I'm reading this table of contents. What do I really honestly in my conscience in private and without telling anybody else, where am I weakest in? And then you wanna drill in there, okay? So uh, I wanna talk about drilling in a minute. Uh, uh, Andres, does that uh, answer the question? Yes, and then my last question was, is this a pass or fail? So if we get a 70 on the ETS, then we get a 70, that's it? Or, right. we, if, get if a, you, or we get a 70, we get a P or an F? If you get 70 percentile or higher, you're done, you pass. If you on the first round, okay? If you get less than 70 percentile, this first round, the next Friday, say you get 69, because you haven't done any weekly quizzes yet, I cannot pass you because we have to set the bar at some point, you know, 69 is not 70. Uh, so if you get 69 percentile or less, uh, you have to stick around for the midterm, okay? Uh, so but yeah. That I understood, but, right. my, but it was more of on our transcript. Would it be like a 70 equals a C or would it be we get no, a no. 70 on the exam and it's a pass or a fail? Right. It so, shows up as a P. Right. This, Right, so this course is only pass fail, which means that you need to pass it to graduate, but it doesn't impact your GPA. Uh, if you pass it, you're not gonna, uh, this is not gonna up your GPA. And if you fail it, it doesn't matter your GPA because you're not graduating. <laughs> so uh, that's, uh, it's a pass fail course. So it doesn't impact the GPA uh, that way. All right. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, keep in mind also at this point, you have taken so many credits that any particular grade right now, any individual grade on average, the course is three credits, right? And you, let's say you are 100 credits, 110 credits plus three um, is not going to impact your GPA that much, all right? Unless you have a very low grade, but the difference between an A and a B at this point, it may make a difference for that individual course, whether you get an A or a B or a C, but with regards to the GPA, at this point, you have accumulated so many credits that a three credit course, whether it's an A or B or a C, will impact very little on your actual GPA, all right? So it's more significant at this point toward the end of the game of the, of the bachelors, it's more significant the grade for the individual course than for upping or downing your GPA. Again, unless you get a low score, like a D or an F, then that will definitely lower your GPA somewhat, but even not that, that much either. All right, it's just a statistical thing. Anyway, uh, let me talk about the drilling for a moment because again, I wanna get more and more into the subject matter. Mm, yes, so Campbell, systematic, all right? You wanna be organized because otherwise it's chaos. If there's no organization, then it's, it's, it's just a, a chaos. And uh, nature is ordered. We see how well nature teaches us order, right? Because it reflects, nature is actually reflecting the order of God and the wisdom, the infinite wisdom of God is reflected in nature, all right? Natural law is a reflection of divine law and there's order. God is order, one aspect of, of God is, is uh, God is order. And so to study orderly at the practical level will be this. Let's say that um, I think I'm weak in, uh, I don't know, chapter seven of Campbell, whatever chapter that is, all right? What I'm gonna do is I'm going to go to the back of the chapter where there is uh, some questions there, sample questions. Okay, the back of, the, of each chapter, there are sample questions. And I'm gonna take those questions and I'm gonna uh, do the questions, do the answers and see how I score. Because maybe I'm not as weak as I thought, or maybe I'm actually weaker than I thought. <laughs> okay, and I, uh, I scored a zero on, on those few questions, didn't get any of them right. Or maybe I got them all, etc. So then, <clears throat> I, I'm trying to really parse into what area of knowledge I'm missing. What am I not getting right about that chapter seven? Okay, so once I do, I'm gonna work backwards, really. I'm gonna work backwards. 
in that chapter. I'm going to go to the quiz questions at the end. Once I do that quiz, then I'm going to move in a little bit to the review of the chapter. There's a review, which is like two or three pages, all right? And I'm going to review, I'm going to read that review, see if that clarifies my doubt. And if then after studying that review, I can answer the question that I got wrong. If I still don't get it with the review, because the review is a summary, then I go into the chapter itself. And each chapter, you know, is divided by sections and so forth. So then I'm getting into the weeds more and more. All right. And I'm going to go into the actual chapter and read those paragraphs and look especially at the graphics, the images, and so forth to try to understand the concept that I didn't understand before. All right. And that's, and then if I still don't get it after going into Campbell's chapter uh, and section that I didn't understand, if I still don't get it, I'm going to go online because. Campbell is not the only biology book. I'm going to go online and Google photosynthesis or whatever or, uh, the redox reaction, all right? And I'm going to try to get from Google the answer that I'm looking for because Campbell, I didn't understand what uh, he was talking about, okay? So you see how you're self-teaching. Mm -hmm. And after doing that, if online, I still, I, I'm just actually getting more confused by going online because everything is appearing in, in Russian or Chinese. Then I'm going to find one of us, one of the professors, and I'm going to sit with that professor one on one. And finally, she or he is going to explain to me what I just couldn't understand before. I just couldn't teach myself about that. You follow? So that's that's the flip. That's how. And believe me, you if you have not uh, done this before and you have not uh, confirmed this, we are capable of teaching ourselves just about anything we want to learn, all right? It can be done because now there's so much stuff online. I ask my students, you have access to internet? Of course, professor, I have access to internet. Well, good, because now you don't have an excuse for not knowing everything <laughs> that you want to know, all right? And even what you don't want to know, it's all on the internet. And then it's a question of discerning between the good, the bad, and the ugly, <laughs> and the beautiful, right? because uh, you get everything. It's like drinking out of the fire hose. You have to discern what is really the useful, the good uh, and, and true information, okay? But you follow, you will be teaching yourself that way, okay? So back to this first week that you have now, literally a week from now until next Friday, um, get into the table of contents of Campbell and go through it, those 55, 56 chapters and see where you think you're weakest, all right? And then within those chapters, start drilling in, start from the back, do the, the quiz there, and then move forward, as I explained, into the review section. And then if you still need more clarification, get into the actual chapter and so forth. And uh, it's kind of a, a blitz that you're gonna do this week, all right? But keep in mind that this is not the first time you see this stuff. Okay, you've been at it for four years one way or another. So maybe some courses that were done a long time ago, organic one or whatever, you may need to review some of that or chemical nomenclature, who knows. But uh, you've seen it at some point, all right? You've seen at least some of it at some point. So self-confidence also um, can go a long ways. Hmm? But not self-deception, you have to be careful. Self-confidence is one thing and Self-deception is just, oh, I can ace this. I'm the master. I just go in and, and uh, I breathe. Not going to happen. <laughs> OK. All right. Uh, anything else? Questions, comments? You said it will be like next week at 4 PM. Is it online? It's online, but it's here on campus because I have to proctor it. OK, and uh, it's a secure site that we have up in uh, CCL 203. CCL 203 is a science building, second floor, the computer lab upstairs uh, across <laughs> from the um, that lab where they have the mannequins, where they have the same men and women and babies, uh, the nursing people use that. Uh, anyway, upstairs in the uh, computer lab. I'll be there. I'm saying four o'clock, but we'll probably start the actual uh, test. Uh, so I've scheduled the room from four to 9 p.m., all right? And uh, 
and we'll get started hopefully by about 4.15, 4.30 more or less. But once we start, you all have to start at the same time and then uh, move forward. Like I said, it's a secure site that we have. Uh, so there's a little app that has been installed in those computers already. And that's what we have it set up up there. Once you start, you're working on an individual basis and your focus is on that screen and that screen alone and so forth. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so all you need for that day is your uh, student ID number. And then you have to fill out a little registration um, so that you actually create an account, a personal student account in ETS uh, website. And then that gives you access uh, to the test. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, uh, Ricky, I got your uh, message, no problem. Mm, uh, like I Thank said, you. I'll send you the recording of this at the end. Okay, what else? David, anyone? I have a question, Professor Chalfi. It's Brianna. Yeah. Brianna? Mm -hmm. Um. I don't know if you know, but I haven't been going to school because my mom has COVID. Right. So how does how is this gonna work? Right. So my me? basic question is this: When did uh, you start the quarantine? She just got tested again yesterday, and she tested, she's still positive. Mm hmm. Yeah. Okay. We'll see what develops by the um, by. Uh, next, uh, it's another week from now, all right? Have you tested? Uh, um, sorry, let me take it back, don't answer. It, it may be considered a confidential um, question actually, but um, you can let me know confidentially, please. And this goes for okay. all of you, all right? This is in honesty because I'm not gonna get into your conscience, all right? But if any of you have tested uh, positive uh, for COVID, uh, in the past week, uh, please let me know confidentially. All right. Uh, by the way, uh, let me give you my cell phone number, which is uh, 786 489 9369. Let me share the screen for a moment. Uh, I always give my students uh, my cell phone number because that's really, in today's age, the easiest way to communicate back and forth. Let me just open a little document here so that it will remain uh, recorded. Okay, so if in the past week you have uh, tested positive, please let me know confidentially and we'll make arrangements. Basically, what we have to do is wait until you're negative uh, for uh, COVID and then uh, set up a session, okay? But again, I'm relying on your mature conscience because I don't want to be here for two hours. You know, there's 10 of you, all right? And um, <clears throat> that's why we're doing this like that in, in group. So let me see, 786-489-9369. Oh, something happened. There it is, get bigger. Okay, so can you see my cell phone number on the screen? Yes. Okay, thank you, David. Okay, so there it is. Okay. Let me go back to stop sharing so that we can see all the tiles here. Right. Okay, uh, anything else? At the time of the test itself, Next Friday, I will tell you uh, some strategy of how to take these standardized tests. And these strategies actually apply for any standardized test, okay? It's not subject specific. It's just a strategy, uh, things like, for example, you don't wanna leave any uh, um, unanswered question, all right? Because um, an unanswered question automatically counts as wrong. But 
these standardized tests, of course, are multiple choice and there are five answers. And so on average, if you guess, if you guess on average, what percentage, what chance do you have of getting it right? Just by guessing. You don't have a clue about the answer, but you know that one of the answers has to be right. Okay, one of the five. 20, 25% chance. 20, 20% 20, yeah. 20 right? Because 20 times five is 100. So each answer on average is, uh, is a 20% chance. Hmm? Yeah, got it, Amanda. Go ahead. So um, you see, if you leave it blank, then it's a zero, it's a zero percent, right? But if you guess, you have a 20% chance of getting it right. So it's a statistical uh, model, it's probabilistic. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one strategy, uh, but there are others also. And depending on the question, some questions are individual uh, questions on the subject matter. Some have a paragraph first, they describe a paragraph or a table uh, or, or a figure. And then they'll ask you several questions based on that paragraph, table or figure, all right? Two or three questions may be based on that. And so it's a different way of handling that question and so forth. Then there are uh, mathematical or ar arithmetic questions. Uh, I'll talk about those details too much to bog you down with it now because you're not in front of the test anyway. So it's useless to know that uh, really beforehand. All right, rather I'll cover those issues um, uh, on Friday, on Friday when we meet. Right now, concentrate on the subject pattern. Just do a real soul search on where you think uh, you are weakest and uh, drill into that, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, the crucial question is that essentially, unless you have uh, tested positive recently for COVID, everyone else is available uh, next Friday, 4 p.m., right? Okay, I don't yes, see any Mm -hmm. Okay. Wait, I have to check my soccer schedule because I might have practice, but let me check on. Okay. If you have sports, I'm going to ask you to please speak with your coach. This is crucial. Uh, you can see that especially passing this first time around frees you up tremendously. All right. So speak with your coach, please, and um, work it out. If you need to arrive like at 4.15 or something like that, that's fine, all right? But nothing after 4.30 really, because we'd probably be starting by, by that time. Plus you'll be missing all the hints that I'm gonna give you beforehand uh, to enhance your, um, your scoring, okay? So if you have any other issues, uh, work, uh, practice, whatever, please, please, please work it out. This is a very special opportunity, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, doctor, Great. I have a question. Thanks, Nikki. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yes, Brian. Okay, so really the only way to study for this test is to go through the book and as much as we can till next Friday, right? Yes. Uh, well, there's another alternative that I just thought really is go back to your courses. Hopefully you have notes uh, that you took from your courses, right? And if it's a particular course that you struggle more with, uh, get into that. Mm -hmm. And then you have the professor because each course is attached to a professor. All right. So don't forget, you have the professor as a resource. It's just try to do your work. Try to teach yourself before you come to us. Okay. And you will see that it can be done. Mm -hmm. But of course, you always have us as a resource. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure, Brian. Okay. Anything else? I'll leave you with Is this, this meeting over because uh, I have class like in 10 minutes? Oh, wow. Well, yeah, right. 925. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm going to close with a little anecdote from Einstein. Everybody's heard of Albert Einstein, right? Probably one of the greatest minds we had last century and so on and so forth, uh, at least scientifically. Uh, on other issues, uh, uh, anyway. Um, so Albert Einstein, uh, there's even this, um, this, uh, thought out there that he failed a physics course when he was uh, in high school or in his bachelor is the, the, the uh, they call it the baccalaureate in, in uh, Europe. Um, 
Uh, but it's not true, is that uh, that uh, particular year at the school where he was at in Switzerland, they flipped the grading. <laughs> and so they were actually putting uh, the high numbers meant a low grade score <laughs> and, the, and the low grade uh, and the low numbers on that scale meant a high grade. They, they just flipped the, the, the thing backwards. And so he appears with a very high uh, or with a very low number. Uh, and so people thought that he had failed that course, but it's, it's not true, okay? Mm, what is true is this is that in a number of his courses early on at his bachelor level, uh, he was bored stiff from what was being taught in physics because it was kind of a, an old fashioned classical physics, very theoretical. And he was a theoretical physicist. He was never inside a lab uh, doing experiments himself. He was a theoretical physicist, but a brilliant mind because he would develop thought experiments, okay? Now, in um, regards to uh, mm, the thought experiments, for example, uh, one time he was on the trolley, uh, he used to work at a patent office <laughs> uh, in Switzerland, and uh, <clears throat> he was going to, to his office, uh, and he noticed that there was some construction going on <clears throat> uh, at a building some distance away and there was an external elevator. You know, one of these elevators that is a working elevator, right, for construction, that is basically like a cage, like a, a metal cage on some uh, steel bars and it goes up and down on the outside of the building, all right? <clears throat> and so he was just thinking all the time uh, creatively. And he thought, well, if that elevator somehow got uh, loose on the gear system and started falling, free falling, all right? And it would fall, it would accelerate. It's not a speed, but it's an acceleration because of gravity, right? And it will start accelerating at the speed of gravity, at the acceleration of gravity, the 9.8 uh, meters per second square. And if there was a person inside the elevator at some point, uh, if the, and if the elevator was high enough, the building was high enough, hypothetically high enough, uh, X distance high, when it would reach that, when it would it continue to accelerate at some point, the mass of the individual inside the elevator would counteract the, uh, the gravitational pull and that person will start floating inside the elevator will start floating and in fact uh, for training purposes this what this is what NASA uses to fake zero gravity all right to fake zero gravity they take these astronauts in training inside a, a large plane large body plane and fly that plane very high close to the stratosphere and then that plane starts dropping and starts dropping, and at some point it goes faster than the speed that the uh, gravitational pull, all right, accelerating um, a little faster. And what happens is the people inside the plane start floating, or start lifting up, all right, and it has the feel, the sensation as if they were in zero gravity. In fact, what is happening is that they're free falling, but the plane is falling faster than they are. So it gives the sensation as if they are free floating. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, uh, got it, uh, David, go ahead. All right, so you see, um, so he was thinking about this a century before NASA came up with the actual experiment uh, to, to do it, all right? Just by uh, having that thought in, a, um, in an elevator that would be free falling like that. At some point, if that elevator accelerated fast enough, then the individual inside the accelerator will start floating. All right, and give the sensation that that individual is in a zero gravity. Of course, that elevator, that individual is gonna come crash into reality as soon as the elevator hits the ground, right? Because it's gonna go from um, 9.8 meters per second square acceleration to zero, <laughs> you know, in an instant. And so uh, that would be a tragic thing. That's why it's an imagination. Okay, it's a thought experiment. You can do thought experiments without hurting anybody. Uh, but then he flipped it. And this is the creativity. He said, what if we put that elevator, we do the reverse. In other words, what if the uh, elevator is accelerating outward against the speed of gravity because our, 
our gravity on Earth is caused by the core of the Earth, which you know is, is a solid uh, ball of iron, which is the most abundant, abundant element on Earth is iron, and that's the core of iron. And it's solid and it's quite hot, by the way. But anyway, that is what causing our gravity. But as we go further away from that core, in other words, as we go away from the Earth, the gravitational pull diminishes. That's why it's an acceleration and not a speed, right? Not a velocity. It diminishes until at some point we're so far away that we actually go into zero gravity as far as the Earth is concerned. But then we're influenced by other gravitational pulls, like for example, the sun. Oh, it's also exerting gravitation on us. That's what's keeping the Earth rotating or translating actually uh, around the um, around the sun, you see? So there are all these gravitational fields on, uh, on space, in space. And so there's really no empty space as such. It may be empty of matter, but there are energies going through, especially all these gravitational fields, okay? And that's what led him eventually to his theory of relativity, all right? First, the special theory of relativity, which um, um, assumes a constant speed, and then the general theory of relativity, which could be with uh, um, not in a non-Euclidean uh, fashion, not in a flat plane. Anyway, my point is that by doing thought experiments, all right, which didn't cost anything, did not go into an actual lab, use any kind of instrumentation at all, just by using his mind, he came up with the theory of relativity, all right, by using his thought experiments. And it was fascinating to, to it's a series of uh, videos actually that I heard on, on his life, uh, just, just fascinating. So you can do the same, but back to that lecture, he was totally bored uh, at his uh, math and physics lectures. And so he would be distracted and uh, didn't pay attention. And the professors were annoyed by that. In fact, one professor at some point said to him out loud in front of the rest of the class, your mere presence makes us disgusting. <laughs> you know, something like that. It was so offensive that today that professor would be sued out of the water <laughs> uh, for saying something like that, okay? So what Einstein said uh, in his mind said, oh, you don't like my presence? Well, goodbye to you. And he spent the rest of his time in the library. And he was reading the latest physics and mathematical articles in the scientific journals that were coming out of the time, which not being taught in the classroom, you see? And so he taught himself when he was your age, mathematics and physics, and then started thinking, started thinking for the rest of his life, uh, all these thought experiments. So uh, also, by the way, when he published, he seldom used very few references, very few references in his, uh, just the bare minimum necessary uh, to corroborate uh, what he was uh, saying in his publications. But in his uh, uh, articles, you read his articles, very, very few references. Today, you read articles, practically every sentence, uh, every phrase, every paragraph, if not every sentence is, is uh, reference. You know, it's, a, it's an exaggeration. Anyway, just uh, some thoughts there. Mm, I've probably gone on too much too. But uh, all this to say, folks, if um, you have not had this experience yet because we have been <laughs> spoon feeding you or something, you can teach yourself just about anything you want to learn, okay? And this course will make sure that uh, you learn that and that you are confirmed in that uh, thought, in that reality, okay? And you will start today and you will get the first confirmation <laughs> next Friday, a week from today. Anything else? Do I see there are a bunch of chats here? Let me see if I missed something. Okay, basically people have to leave. Uh, okay, I think I've been seeing the chats as we go along. This one. Okay, great. Well, thanks for persevering through all this uh, diatribe. Um, <clears throat> go for it. Just go for it. All right. It can be done. Focus, focus, focus. And uh, we'll see you next uh, Friday, if not sooner. 
If you have any issues, you can either email me or text me, but do it quickly. Don't leave it to last minute, all right? Thanks again, thank folks. You. All the best thank for you, your studies. Have a great weekend. God bless. You too. Bye. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye.